Conventional historiography sees the 1915 blockbuster film Birth of a Nation as evidence of blatant racism and white supremacy. President Woodrow Wilson, after seeing it in the White House, said it was like writing history with lightning. The NAACP, among other organizations, tried to shut the film down. It shocks our sentiments even today, showing the early Ku Klux Klan, which is far different from the later one, rescuing desperate whites from a mob of former slaves. But let us set aside our reactions to Marxism's latest contemporary formula for class conflict known as political correctness and take a second look into the historical record the film was trying to portray. We're struck first with the question, why would the producer D.W. Griffith so boldly present the Ku Klux Klan actually riding in and rescuing beleaguered whites? How could the film portray the former slaves so strangely or so corrupt on the floor of a state legislature? Obviously racism, right? Well, one problem we have today is that we see emancipated slaves of 130 years ago as people just like ourselves. The same culture, the same worldview, the same high school or college education level, the same dreams. Not true. They were a rising people, largely illiterate, penniless, unequipped for economic responsibilities, not yet integrated into society life outside the plantation or farm. The film shows a freed people corrupted by the acquisition of sudden power. Where did this power come from? The post-war southern states had been systematically infiltrated by northern Union Leaguers or Loyal Leaguers. These were patriotic zealots, true Yankees if you will, sent south to raise up the blacks by force as quickly as possible and to use them to maintain radical Republican control of the post-war South. In each state, tyrant carpetbag governors and Union League leaders, now supplied with weapons and uniforms by the federal government, began to organize armed black militias, estimated eventually at 280,000 strong across the South. By secret oaths and ceremonies, the freedmen were seduced by power and taught that they had every right to hate whites and to take revenge for slavery, to intimidate uncooperative black voters, to burn houses and barns, to rape and even murder. Bitter hatred raged between a people that had lived peaceably with each other for 200 years. The Southern whites, stripped of their weapons, one-fourth of their men dead from the war, poverty-stricken and most of them not allowed to vote, feared starvation and annihilation. The original KKK arose as a defense force, far different from the Klan of the 1920s. In the pushback, bitter hatred and fears escalated out of control. Gun battles ensued with sometimes hundreds of dead and wounded. Atrocities were committed on both sides. Perhaps the best description of what happened is the largely forgotten minority report from the Congressional Investigation of the Klan. Two-thirds of the 20-man committee were radical Republicans bent on destroying all remaining Southern resistance. Charles Adams, in his book, When in the Course of Human Events, summarizes the minority report. 1. The original Ku Klux Klan arose as a consequence of the Union League's brutality. 2. Many of the crimes against former slaves were done by Union Leaguers disguised as Klansmen. 3. If there were no oppression in the South, there would have been no tyrants carrying carpetbags and no secret organizations. 4. From the oppression and corruption of the one sprang the vice and outrage of the other. The minority report included the following, quote, The Union League hatred of the white race was instilled in the minds of these ignorant people by every art and vile that bad men could devise. Arson, rape, robbery, and murder were things of daily occurrence, and when the great mass of the most intelligent whites were disenfranchised at the ballot and was put into the hands of the Negro by the government in Washington, in short, 
when the people saw that they had no rights, which were respected, no protection from insult, no security for their wives and children, and what little they had saved from the ravages of war was being confiscated by taxation, many of them took the law into their own hands and did deeds of violence, which we neither justify nor excuse. But all history shows that bad government will make bad citizens.